This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is receiving the Word of God. Our scripture reading is from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. And it reads, Now the apostles and the sisters and brothers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, Three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon who is called Peter, and he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Several years ago, commentator John Harvard went to Israel on an interfaith journey with members of a Jewish congregation, an African-American congregation, and the congregation that he served. They went to experience together the places that were important to their sacred stories, and it was an incredible trip for all of them. One of his traveling companions, Rabbi John Friedman, um, said he knew that John wanted to see the house of Simon the Tanner, where Peter had his vision. You see, Jews know many Christian stories, and his friend knew this one was critical to the development of the early church. The visit to Simon's house was a great place to start their journey. Their trip was in the summer of 2001, shortly before the events of September 11th. And in the years since, when I visited in 2005 and Linda visited more recently, 
have come to realize how Peter's story has taken on even more significance since 9-11. The text from Acts began with Peter reporting to the church leaders in Jerusalem. It sounds as if he was being called on the carpet for breaking the rules. He had been eating with the uncircumcised. A uh, familiar uh, charge had been leveled against Jesus for eating with sinners back in Luke chapter 15. So Peter was in good company, but that didn't make his confrontation with the Jerusalem leaders easier. Have you ever been in a church meeting when you could feel the tension in the air? Such meetings often center around who is in and who is out. In the present case, the tension was between those drawing a narrow circle of inclusion around the gospel and others who were busy expanding the circle until all of God's children had a place at the table. Would Gentiles have a place? That was the question hanging in the balance along with the integrity and expansion of the early church. Fortunately, God had a witness. Peter was the pivotal figure, the rock, whose confession had changed the dynamics of Jesus's relationship with his followers and opened the door to discipleship. Remember the promise that the risen Lord had made to his disciples, that they would see, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of this promise is nowhere more evident than in the boldness of Peter's testimony in Jerusalem. You see, God empowered Peter, an ordinary fisherman, to play a significant role in the mission of the church. In this passage, Peter seeks to justify to the circumcision party in Jerusalem his having eaten with an unspoken implication of his having accepted their hospitality. This Roman centurion Cornelius and his family in Caesarea that Cornelius and others received the spirit and were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, inaugurating a mission to the Gentile world, seems at first to have been lost on these headquarters conservatives. They first focused on Peter's apparent violation of the Jewish dietary laws. It's true. Peter describes his vision of the great sheep filled with clean and unclean animals and the command to kill and eat. But for him, the point is that God had given Cornelius and his companions the same gift of the spirit received by the apostles when they first believed. You see, this is a pivotal realization on which the rest of the book of Acts and the missionary journeys turn. To Peter, of all people, to have concluded that God included and intended the inclusion of the Gentiles and for him to have defended this proposition with so full a recital of his understanding of the gospel, gave this step a chance with the Jerusalem conservatives. Besides, Peter could truthfully say that he didn't take the initiative in any of this. The vision came to him. He was called by others to come, to heal, to preach, to baptize. God was speaking through him. Who was he to resist God? It is significant 
that the near term struggle turned on the issue of clean and unclean meat, we would have expected both Peter and his opponents to have focused on the notion of legitimate Israelite descent. After all, in his sermon at the beautiful gate in Acts 3, Peter stressed the power of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors. Cornelius and his friends and family had no claim to this sacred history. Apparently, it was easier, if still not simple, for Jews of the time to overlook issues of Israelite genealogy than to overcome their sense of repulsion at people who ate the flesh of unclean animals. Repulsion, either in the ancient world or now, doesn't respond to theological arguments. A change of heart comes when we see the spirit at work in the stories of strangers, recognizing in them the same spirit that is working in our own lives. People need first to see God at God's surprising work. Theological reflection comes afterwards, either to bring what has been seen in cohesiveness with past thinking or to make a reasoned break with that thinking. In the ancient world, one would search the scriptures in order to find a place in them for this new insight. And then one would seek principles for integrating this new vision into practice, a task undertaken at the Council of Jerusalem as described in Acts 15. Yet in every age, we see human resistance to every new thing, including the gospel that everything has become new. Is there anything in the faith that does not change? If Peter's preaching is the criterion, then the changeless elements are speaking the name of Jesus, bearing witness to his resurrection and acknowledging the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We may add to this the under, uh, foundational principle recorded in Acts 11 where notions of clean and unclean as ways of separating people from one another are ruled hostile to Christian faith forever, invalidating any attempt on our part to reinstate them in any form or ever. Peter's speech makes two substantial additions to the initial narrative that we had read in Acts chapter 10. The first is his reference to these six brothers who accompanied him, who entered the man's house. Even though it remains unclear from the earlier account whether they had agreed with Peter's action, he now transforms the six into multiple witnesses who can confirm his report as trustworthy. The second and more important change comes with Peter's retelling of Cornelius's report of an angelic visitor. Only now does Peter disclose heaven's confirmation that his house call would become the means by which you and your entire household will be saved. God enables ordinary people to be witnesses to the gospel. This can be frightening because it voids our excuses that we are not gifted enough not old enough, not good enough to get the job done. God has always had the audacity 
to choose ordinary people to do extraordinary things in the service of God's reign. Such a realization should give us hope and strengthen our resolve to join the cloud of witnesses from Abraham and Sarah and Moses to uh, Esther and Jeremiah and Peter and Paul. Peter gives testimony to church leaders about a vision he received while praying on a roof. He saw a sheep being lowered from heaven with a variety of creatures on it. He was told to kill and eat. Peter refused because the food was profane and unclean. And then he hears the critical line. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. The cycle repeated three times and then everything was taken up into heaven. This vision was followed by the arrival of the three men from Caesarea who appeared at the door. Peter was instructed by the spirit to go with them and not distinguish between them and us. When he arrives at Cornelius's house and preaches, the spirit led the Gentiles to salvation. Peter concludes that God has given them the same gift that God had given the Jewish believers. Then he asks the profound question, who was I to hinder God? Think about the astonishing insight contained in the question. If God so loved the world that Jesus came not to condemn the whole world, but to save it, who are we to try to limit the mission of God to redeem humanity? Every time we exclude someone from full participation in the redemptive efforts of God, Peter's question should trouble us and the church. What if the church had closed the door to the Gentiles and Christianity had remained a sect within Judaism? Peter was persuaded that God the creator did not intend to exclude anyone from the community of God's care. His conclusion was revolutionary. Those of us in the faith community often use the word discernment. Peter discerned the connection between his vision and the three visitors who asked him to travel to Caesarea with them. Luke makes it clear that the gift of discernment is the work of God's spirit. If there is hope for the church in these days, when there is so much dissension and division in faith communities, then we must pray to have visions that bring us together to receive the gift of discernment. We need to be open to the work of God's healing and reconciling spirit. More amazing than Peter's vision and discernment was how the leaders in the Jerusalem responded. They listened and were open to the new reality Peter envisioned. They could have said, you must be out of your mind. This is wrong. But instead, the Holy Spirit gave them ability to listen and to change. As we go about our business in the church, the world is watching. Do we have anything to offer that differs from other groups characterized by dissension and division? Can we listen to each other and seek to discover where God's spirit is leading? Can we broaden the table so everyone has a place? Can we share the good news so everyone has an opportunity to receive the word of God? 
thanks be unto God for including you and me. Believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ by confessing faith in Christ and being baptized into his church. We are given new life through faith and baptism. We receive a new identity, life in the spirit. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for providing a way of faith and salvation that is broad enough to include me in the way of eternal life and a new identity as your child. Thank you for your unending love and mercy. Thank you for the power of your good news. Thank you for inviting us to be partners in mission and ministry. For teaching us to share the good news so that all may receive. Thank you for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gifts that work together for your glory and for your honor. Lord, teach us to trust and depend on you. Lord, teach us to show love and concern for others in the things we say and do. Lord, we ask for your protection, for your guidance, for your forgiveness. Replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with healing. Replace our anxiety with your joy and your peace and your hope and your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.